Berry and welcome to another Sparker Nation conversation. My special guest today is Dawn Kotzer. She's from Canada and we've had the privilege of being together in an online peer group um, and I've been fascinated with a number of conversations we've had there and I thought I absolutely need to get Dawn to come and be my special guest in one of these Sparker Nation conversations. So welcome Dawn. Um, Thanks Ian, it's great to be here. Equally, I welcome Anna, who's in Amsterdam, who's the first person I think who ever attended after midnight. So uh, wonderful, Anna. Mary is um, also in Canada. We have Donovan, who's in Melbourne. Brian, who's in Geelong, Australia. Brad, who's in Brisbane, Australia. And David, who's in Ballarat, Australia. And uh, myself, I'm on the Ballarat Peninsula, which is um, about an hour and 10 minutes train ride from Melbourne. So we're in different locations, but I'm sure we're of like heart and mind. And I thought we'd begin, um, Dawn, with the obvious question, seeing we called this Mojo Now, I thought we'd begin our conversation with, well, what's Mojo and what's, and what's the Mojo Now piece? You know, Ian, last night I was thinking about this and I thought, so Ian's going to ask me some questions and, you know, he, he asked earlier a while back, is there anything in particular you'd like me to ask you? But it was only last night that I thought, Ian is going to ask me, what's mojo? And I thought, huh, I know what it feels like. But how can I explain it the most succinctly? So I gave it some thought. And I, mojo is booster juice. Booster and juice. And it could be. Booster juice. It could be booster juice for your creative soul. It could be booster juice for your ambition. It could be booster juice for your courage. It could be booster juice for your resilience, your determination, your perseverance. It can actually even be booster juice for acceptance. Booster. Because, yeah. yeah, booster juice. Don't ask me how many calories, how many carbo carbo carbohydrates it has. I know nothing. It probably has club soda in it. That's all I can say. That's all I know for sure. Well, here in Australia, we I think we, we have a company called Booster Juice. So it's kind of... Um, oh, okay. I'm sure, well, that's the exact name, but they're famous for their juices that, you know, boost your energy. Right. Right. Well, that that's kind of what Mojo is. It's yeah. for me, um, it kind of evolved. It's evolved. Um, it's not a new term, Mojo. Lots of people use it for many different reasons. But I actually sort of find that I access, I learned how to access Mojo, not when things were going easy, but when things are going hard. And I really do mean it's how do you raise your vibration uh, so that you don't feel you have to run away from home or your life? Because I'm sure everybody here has realized you can't snap your finger, fingers and design your perfect life. You can't, you can't change things on a dime. You can change things. But what you can, you cannot always change them on a dime. And so the last 15 years for myself, have been particularly challenging and I've learned, you know, embracing your rant can be a lot of fun. It, it can raise your energy to embrace your rant instead of to, to run away from it doesn't help. You're ranting, okay, if you're ranting, what are you ranting about? Like, listen, listen to your rant and you get all sorts of good booster juice. It's amazing how we tell ourselves the truth when we rant. Wonderful. Wonderful. I immediately thought of um, this, um, Donovan and David and, and Brad and Brian. We're, we're at, um, I host a peer group where they're all members, um, as well as being regulars in this conversation. And we have a um, we follow the Jason Fox idea of having a one word that's kind of our theme for the year. Um, and right. um, I've actually changed mine three times. <laughs> so my, my, my word now is flow. And um, it was effortless before that. And it was 
uncomplicated before that, but where I began when I first started thinking about this year, last year, the word was energized. Um, so you can see there's a kind of a, a, a flow and um, Jason's been one of it, one of the guests on, on this first Wednesday conversation. And, uh, but yeah, I get this, this idea, um, what's coming for me and I'm interested in everyone else's, um, what, what you're feeling, what you're thinking, but what's coming up for me is that um, I find I'm energized or in flow the most when I'm coming out of some kind of difficulty, some kind of stress, some kind of, you know, where I was up against it a bit, you know, um, I'm, I'm absolutely 110% certain that I've learned more in life from failing than I ever did from succeeding. Well, kind of that, that makes, yeah, is that the same that, place? I'm sorry. That, that makes sense because when we're in, when we're in difficult spots, we are in restricted and constricted areas, much like a river. So the banks narrow, but that doesn't mean that the velocity of the water slows down. So there's a bit of a bottleneck. There's a bit of a change in tempo and there's a bit of a, uh, there may be a bit of some impediments or obstacles, but getting, marshalling your energy to get past those obstacles is pretty energizing. And then afterwards, the release that you feel from marshalling, utilizing, and um, getting through it, it really does set you up to flow forward. I love how you change your word. Because there's some people who are so rigid about their one word and I've that's never worked so well for me I, I really appreciate how you change your word how it evolves as you find your pace in the year yeah and that's that's kind of the thing so let, let's let um join in uh, folks what do you because I'm, I'm really identifying that because when I've um I think I've made those changes because I was in a spot of Difficulty, and I use my mojo to <laughs> boost myself to to come back to being in flow. Um, oh, that's good. That that's really good. You okay? I've been in difficulty. I've used my mojo to boost myself to come back into flow. Th yeah. Great. That's really good. I'm going to write that down. I'm going to try and remember that. Yeah. So I know some others um, have been have done the same thing. Um, so let's let's open up the conversation. I was going to jump in because I think I find my mojo in the exact opposite way. I need to unplug. I need to get really still. I need to get really quiet, hang out in my hammock, like be able to nature, not have anything scheduled. And the more consecutive days I can do that, the more I can hear my inner voice, which is what boosts my mojo, which gives me my, mm -hmm. my realignment. Cause I'm in flow when I'm aligned. And it's so easy for me to get uh, misaligned by busyness. Um, so I just wanted to pop in and cause I thought it was interesting how we both come at it a very different way. I think it, I reference for those of you that have read some of my writings in, in the heart leadership book, I call this essence. So essence is really another word for mojo. Um, some people might call it music. Um, you know, it's your music, it's your gift, it's your nature. Um, there's all sorts of terms. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. We all come at it from different ways, but we're using our energy or our life force, if you like, to, to get to the right place for us, you know, to find our rhythm again. What That is another way you could look at it, isn't it? Right. Um, for I, it, this is a really great conversation because I, for me, um, I'm going to be doing more work on this whole mojo now thing. And mine starts with, with the idea of raising our frequencies. Because for instance, when we're feeling shame, the frequency in our body is about 20 
hertz. When we're feeling joy, it's 700. And it is, you can talk about spark. It's possible, it's possible to be in a space of shame or guilt, which is 20 or 30 uh, megahertz, and um, feel a moment of absolute joy. It's like a little, it's like a spark, but it's easily extinguished. And what I have, what I find for me with Mojo now, it's an energetic practice of saying, okay, I'm feeling guilty. I feel guilt. I'm carrying the burden of guilt. My energy is, is, is suffering because of that. So I then, and maybe this comes from being stuck in these kind of crummy places for so long. I can't get to joy, but can I move up to neutral, which is about 250? How can I get from this low ebb just to neutral? And actually, Mary, now that I think of it, um, to lay in my, my, my own hammock here, that would take me to a place of neutral. And from neutral, of course, for those of us who drive standards, drive any, you want to go forward or backward, you got to go through neutral. So let's not pretend that neutral isn't pivotal. But that's a really good reminder, Mary. A really good reminder about the the the, time, the stillness the st and the length of stillness or the depth of stillness that's needed. And and it's so much about the um, the energy. Um, like even though here here we are, we're online, but I'm feeling your energy, Dawn. I'm feeling mm -hmm. I'm feeling everyone's energy. And it's one of the things that we've we've um, tried to really tap into in these conversations because every man and his dog is zoomed out, right? We've got Zoom fatigue. And one of the reasons why we have everyone in camera in these conversations and we don't have slides or any of that <clears throat> is we wanna, we wanna really fix in on everyone's energy. Right. And we wanna, we wanna right. raise the, we wanna, we wanna raise the frequency. Which yeah, exactly. In, in a way that, in a way that is not upsetting for anyone in a way, you know, however, like there's Brad and Donovan and David and Brian, did I get that right? Yeah. B's and D's. So, you know, however, you're finding your kind of groove in the room that you're sitting in. Some of you have kangaroos, but not all of you have kangaroos behind you. So, it 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 it's interesting how we it's like we come to this buffet and we each bring a little morsel of energy and they don't immediately know how they fit they jostle around so very much like your filter or your your artwork behind you donovan where you've got a lot of the dot work that's all individual dots that has floated in and it's found a fit and you tilt, you turn that, uh, rotate it 45 degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees even. And those dots will still fit, but the energy of the whole piece will have changed. So I, I like, Ian, your invitation for people to come with their energy. Show, like, show their energy. Show your energy. I mean, we talk about, you know, show up, you know. Come, 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 come as you are and if that's in a down a down place then that's fine too you know and if you are if you are in a spot of difficulty or disagreement or you're feeling a bit flat we'll come anyway but show up you know yeah. be, be brave like Anna be, be, like Anna yeah <laughs> yep it's a good word <laughs> I think one of the most important things that we as humans do is when we fail or when we don't succeed or we don't achieve what we were aiming to achieve is we accept um and apologies for the mask but it's the rule um we reflect resolve and we and we grow a greater desire to achieve and to succeed whereas if success comes easy that's it it's easy and you and you know there's no effort there's no heart there's no soul into it if if you do if at first you do succeed 
there is nothing there. there, there it doesn't plant that seed and you don't water it and the, and the, the desire to analyze and pull things apart. So sometimes failure um, is the best gift that you can possibly get because it, it teaches you um, how to bring in that passion, how to engage. And if you really want something, you'll, you'll make it work. It's, you know, and it means more when it does work. I, I, I love this uh, concept, Brian, that because of we're in lockdown where you are and you have to wear a mask in your office, but I love the idea that you're you're unmasked in your language. Right, um, Brian. That your story about failing and how you plant a seed and you achieve something. We had, we had a, a friend over here this morning. He comes over once a week. He brings his little three year old daughter. I seem to be here. I for some reason she's a she's adopted me as her troop leader. Maybe because we're always running. We have a large wilderness property here, so there's lots of trouble you can get into. So, um, so she and I are always doing things, and she found, she found these little Russian almond seeds. They look like tiny little almonds, and they were obviously from last year's crop. And I just let them fall. They're just small ornamental bushes, so I let them small. And she was so excited because she found these things on the ground and she wondered, what are these things? And she brought them to me and I said, well, those are Russian almonds. Okay, what do you do with them? Well, we'll crack them open. You crack them open. No, I, I don't think I can crack them open. She, I'll ask dad. So she goes to her dad. He can't crack them open either. They're tough little suckers. And so she, okay, well, they're for the squirrels, he says. And so she said, okay, we'll go feed the squirrels. But she kept hunting. And then she found a spent seed. She found two halves of the Russian almond. And she was so excited because she realized that her daddy couldn't open that almond, but the squirrel could. So your comment, Brian, made me remember that. And it's the, the that Russian almond is important to her because her dad failed to open it, but she went and found evidence where squirrels could open it. Wonderful insight. That ties it all back, isn't it? And sitting there going, by not succeeding is where we learn and we learn resilience and we learn different ways of, you know, uh, different routes to, to work out how, how to get what you want. Um, and then once you've actually got it, that becomes entrenched and you can do it again and again. It's it also, the arm and seed. If, you, if you try and open the almond seed with your hands and you don't succeed, you go and get a hammer, but that obliterates it. So then you go and buy a, 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 you know, a dedicated tool that nut cracks and then you, know, you fail a couple of times and then you, you get the method that, that uh, works and you can harvest as many as you want. It's very it, innovative. Yeah, yes. I think it also illustrates how we need, we need each other and we need nature in yeah. order to you know make it all work and i think we need to be um innovative in that i think it reminds me that you need the struggle to um, not just succeed but to to um it's it's the old journey i think you know here in the netherlands and here in this part of amsterdam we're below sea level so um you know the people had to envision land and had to make land from water so um and that struggle to to create before you can actually know what it's going to look like so you need to envision the dream and you need the struggle to uh continue on your journey i think yeah there was a There's beauty in that yeah, there was a wonderful uh, moment that uh, you just reminded me of, Anna. Um, this is going back. Um, I remember the day, um, but it was um, it was in 1976, so it's a very long time ago. Possibly before a couple of you might have been born, but anyway, um, I was in an audience, and the the presenter was Des Renford, who was an, a famous Australian marathon swimmer. 
And one day he had a heart attack two miles out, out at sea and managed to get back to shore. Um, wow. And uh, he told us that day, and we all got a, we all got a bottle of port to com commemorate his talk. And on the bottle, it read, nothing great is easy. And yeah. I've, I've drunk the port, but I still have the bottle. Um, Very nice. I look at it to remind myself that this is, this is true. Nothing great is easy. You know, there's always, and I think when we've struggled to um, make something or get something happening or whatever, well, there's a greater joy in that anyway, because, you know, we, we had to put our hands to work. We had to put our hearts into it. We had to engage our minds, you know, but something magical happened through the effort. Um, and, and I think this is, again, this is where Mojo, it's Mojo that enables us to be creative, Dawn. Um, it's really the, um, is it the, it's, it kind of fosters our nature and our creativity, doesn't it? Well, for, yeah, I like to think of Mojo as, in the, in the way that I'm approaching it, as, as finding a through line to, and a willingness to raise my frequency just, just a little bit so I can keep going. I mean, maybe I'll raise it a lot, but that's not the purpose here. It's just enough to fuel the next step. So for me, it's, it's a combination of hope. Like it fuels hope. It fuels curiosity. It fuels patience. And all of those things are needed or all of those things bubble to the surface when we are being creative. Because as both uh, Anna and Brian mentioned, it's about this innovation. Like there's applied creativity and there's pure creativity. And often, often we spend probably more of our life with applied creativity, but it's still a very much a creative um, experience. And a spark of pure creativity goes a long way. I love what you said, Anna, about how they had to learn how to make land from water. That took pure, the spark of pure creativity. And then, I don't know, megatons, like mega, 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 megatons of applied creativity. That was, that was really great the way you said that. Thanks. And it stood the test of time too, hasn't it, Anna? It, it... Yeah, knock on wood, yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely, yeah, we're still here. <laughs> One of the things too, um, just so that we, we don't worry about silence here, we know that Silence is a door to creativity. So, just for for folks that are first time in this conversation, we 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 embrace the silence. I'd like to say that's a very wise approach. Pun possibly intended, but not really. It's very true. So, it's it's a it's wise to train ourselves to in a, sit in silence. Yes, I was in a room once and we waited 11 minutes. And then the youngest, most inexperienced person in the room who just happened to be a woman in a room full of men, she was the first to speak after 11 minutes and it changed everyone's lives forever. So it's okay to wait. It's okay to sit in the silence. As the facilitator that day, I was getting a little nervous at the 11 minute mark. 
Hey, John, can I just ask a quick question? Actually, firstly, thank you for sharing your idea around frequencies. I wasn't aware that shame was around 20 hertz or megahertz and joy was at 700. So thanks for introducing that, uh, that to me. I'll, I'll look into that a bit further afterwards. But also at the start, you know, you said you can't change things on a dime. Like you can't go from, I don't know, zero to 100 uh, quickly. So I was just curious, what does the practice of, of Mojo now look like to you? Like what, is, what are some of the things that you do when you find your things at one end of the spectrum and you want to get to the other? Oh, thanks for that question. The practice. It's probably summed up with the word listen, but it's the many different facets of listen. So you listen with your ears, you listen with your skin, because your skin feels different than, and it almost sounds different. You listen with your gut. So you listen with your you listen with your aware ego. But the really important part of that is, like I, 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 don't, I don't think ego is a, a dirty word. I think we have a healthy ego. That's what keeps us going. That's what keeps us striving. That's what gets us up after we fail, you know, to try again and innovate. As Brian said, we try better ways until we find something that works, you know, just, just great. So, but we also have to, we have to listen to what I call the other ego, which is the BS ego. We really have to listen to that part of our ego. And that's, so I would say that when I'm, when I'm in a place of shame, I guess I listen, I listen to my body. I feel the shame and I've learned to say, hi, shame, I see you. It's probably the most important thing I can do with anything is high shame, high joy, high neutrality, high um, courage. Courage, interestingly, courage is a lower frequency than neutrality, which I think is fascinating. And love is a lower frequency than joy, which makes perfect sense to me. But so I think I listen and I say, I see you. And if I'm having a difficult time with I see you, I take that a step further and I say, here, here's a chair for you beside me. I've made space for you beside me. And simply doing that, you'll find that your, ener your energetic frequency has changed. Again, it may not stick, it may not stay that for a while, but this I see you tool is quite dynamic. Does that does that help? Does that answer your question a bit? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, I like that idea of listening with like all, not just with your ears. Yeah, your skin, your gut. I think that's one of my problems too. I don't listen to my gut. You know, your gut kind of your body knows how you feel about certain things, and we, we often ignore it. I think that's one of the things I've got to get more in tune with is listening to my my body. And and if you find yourself ignoring your gut, you get to say, hi, I see you ignoring your gut. Mm. You get to see that too, because that's, that's, mm. uh, that, that's the resistance part or a certain type of resistance. Mm. Um, I don't have a real problem with resistance either, because sometimes resistance is exactly the traction we need to get up the freaking hill. Mm. But when we refuse or we, we, we are out of practice or we're not, we don't, we forget to listen to our gut. You can do that after the fact and say, oh, I see, I see that. I forgot, I see that. Yeah. Right, thanks, Don. I think, I think there's so much there. We could, we could spend a week on that, on that bit, Don. Uh, what struck me is it's kind of, um, it's about feeling out loud. You know, it's like, um, I know the, the power of, um, if you're in a, when we're in a room with people and just acknowledging that we actually see one another. I was trying to think of the, there's an African tribe that got a wonderful word for I see you, but I, it, I just can't find the word at the moment. But I think, you know, you probably heard it, but, but, you know, but to say I see you to yourself, that's, that's incredibly powerful. 
it's helpful. It's really, really helpful. We, as I mentioned, I've had some, Mary and Anna actually know a little bit about my story and Ian, you might too, but these last 15 years have been very challenging. And so dealing every spectrum of emotion has come up because of what, what's gone on. And so some of you may have uh, felt this, you just can't sleep at night. You cannot quiet yourself to go to sleep. And this is another way I use my mojo practice. So finally I thought, well, this is ridiculous. These things are not leaving me alone. So I may as well investigate. So what I ended up doing was visualizing a long dormitory. And this dormitory has a row of beds on each side, small cots. And there's this fairly wide aisle in the middle of this room. And at the end of the room is this beautiful window where you can walk toward the light if that's what you choose to do. And as you go, or as I, as I would walk towards light, I'd say, oh, anxiety, are you still awake? Tell you what, let me tuck you in. I'm not gonna forget about you. I promise I won't forget about you. But you know what, we'll both feel better about a conversation after we have some sleep. Let me tuck you in, keep walking. Oh, nervousness or, or guilt. Guilt, are you still awake? I'm gonna tuck you in. You know what, I think we're gonna be able to talk about this easier after a good night's sleep. And I just visualize tucking all of these things in and saying, I will not abandon you. I will not forget about you. I will not ignore you. But you know what? We all need some sleep. And that's part of this, I see you, I see all, I see me, I see all the parts of me. I see all the parts of me that are too pushy. And I see the parts of me that are too reticent. I see the, you know, all I see the parts of me. When we talk about shadow, someone mentioned shadow, maybe it was you, Ian. We have, we have the darker shadow and then we have the golden shadow. And the golden shadow is very, it's very important to us, but it still only appears during troubled times. But the golden shadow holds this seed of innovation and creativity. One of my one of my favorite um, little books that I've I've um, had now for a very long time. When I met the author um, in person, I think it's thirty it's thirty years ago. But the book's called Owning Your Own Shadow. And it was written, oh. by Robert, written by Robert Johnson, a Jungian psychologist. And he talks about how the gold is in the shadow. In other words, the, the greatest part of us is in the dark side. And it's a wonderful, yeah. uh, I'm sure you can still get the book. Um, if you see my bookshelves there, it's, it's, um, it's, in, it's there somewhere. Um, because oh, it's, okay. one my, it's one of my um, all time favorites. Um, but I, I but one of the things that he talks about in owning your own shadow, um, and it, it really, you've taken this to a whole new level, um, Dawn, uh, is, is self-talk. Because um, what, you're, what you're describing is, is self-talk, but talking to ourselves at all these different levels and all these different, you know, I was thinking characters, you know, I, I quickly wrote down in my, my, uh, my notes, I quickly wrote down all these different characters that would be in my dormitory, <laughs> um, and the, I think there's a lot of a lot of fun could be had with them, um, you know, giving the giving anxiety and guilt <laughs> and giving all those oh. you, know, you know names. You know, the, yeah. Well, I I have I have a lot of fun with the blankets that I tuck them in. They get bumblebee blankets, like not. Not as in bumblebees, but striped, like bright yellow and bright black. And it's really funny when you, and you know which blanket, which emotional state, which energetic frequency wants. It, it, it was very helpful. I don't really know how I stumbled upon it years ago, but it was really very helpful at the time. And I continue to use it and share it with people. One of the things that happened is I I, um, I was walking the streets of Melbourne and came across a Robert Johnson lecture by by accident, um, 
and uh, I went into the room and it was really a life-changing experience because I, I had heard of Carl Jung then, but didn't know a lot about Jungian psychology um, and to actually see um, a Jungian psychologist, one of his most famous proteges in the flesh was a, was a fascinating experience. But one of the things that I absolutely remember from that night, um, he made a, a comment that um, the voice, the voice, the little voice that we hear is not who we are. It's just an aspect of who we are. Um, and the idea that, um, you know, we are not our thoughts, but we're the being who's having them. And mm -hmm. 35 years ago, whatever it was, that was a, a kind of a new, that was a new door for me to walk through. But um, as I say, synchronicity brought me to that place in that time and it changed everything. And now you've got this I... another place where we can, I think, you know, explore this idea that Mojo has a, has a lot of brothers and sisters. <laughs> And and we, we need to often engage them all, but we can we can do yeah. it in a way that doesn't cause stress. So, yeah, I, I'll I'll be quiet because you've sent me off on a creativity loop that I but, might I mightn't come back from for an that, hour. That's a good one. That's a good one. Well, you know, that's the thing. There's so many different, regardless, unless you were, I suppose, very fortunate. I don't know if that's quite the right word. Many of us were brought up, and this is a generalization I realize, but many of us were brought up with this very rather narrow idea of who we were. One of the questions I ask people, the people I work with, when they're having trouble sorting out whose voice, who's saying what, what they should do, and I'll just say, Whose filter are you using? And it's very simple to tell because you just say, whose filter? What do you mean whose filter? Well, whose voice do you hear when you hear that? Is it a man? Is it a woman? Is it old? Is it young? That if it, if it feels crappy, if it feels crappy to you, there's a good chance it's not your own voice. Truth doesn't feel crappy. Wonderful insight. Truth may feel Truth may feel raw. Truth may feel mm, persistent. Truth may feel heavy, but truth usually doesn't feel crappy. So when you have these thoughts and you feel crappy, it's 99.5% likely that you are picking up somebody, you're using somebody else's filter to in your thought process wonderful insight. and that's not a bad that's not a bad thing it's a good thing it's good to know i like I, oh that's good to know oh my goodness i just caught my mother telling me blah 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 good to know and then i get to say well maybe maybe that was exactly what you needed to hear oh maybe nope nope not not today <laughs> again good to know good to know yeah this is why i encourage people to hear your heart first because your heart never lies your heart is always yeah. always speaking the truth it's only the mind and i know as i work with the heart first head second process um took me mm -hmm. took me three years to get to a point where i could tell my and i i used to say to my mind out loud be quiet I do not want to. <laughs> I do not want to hear from you at this moment. And it, as I say, it took me three years to get to a place where I can put my mind in its place and just listen to my heart because I've learnt. Right, heart. and see, heart, Ian, you just heart. said you just said something really, really important. It's you don't, you know, you don't shoot the messenger. You don't say. I'm going to banish you to an island mind or thoughts. You, you just set it aside. Here's a chair. I put a chair here for you. You get to sit on here. I won't abandon you. I see you. I'm with you. But right now, 
<laughs> that, exactly. Yeah. And I will, I will often say um, out loud, and my wife's got used to me talking to myself in this way, but I, I will I will say to myself, you know, okay, I'm, I'm happy to hear thoughts now. I'm, I'm happy to hear your input. Um, because I've, I've heard my own inner voice, my own essence, my own mojo. I've heard mm -hmm. the truth. And now I'm open to, you know, the how. I think this is, this is, you know, the what and why always come before the how. But we spent a lot of our lives working on how. Particularly us blokes, you know, gentlemen in the room, we're always working out how are we going to do this? You know, how are we going to fix this? All that stuff. And some of us have come to the realization that we don't have to fix it. Us blokes, we 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 don't have to fix it. We've we've just got to take a different different approach. May I ask Don a question? Yeah. yeah, go for it. So this is something I learned from you, and I just applied it the other day. But I wanted to okay. um, bring it back into context with the mojo and and using your mojo to get you through that to the next step. So one of the things you often say when you coach is, "Oh, isn't that curious?" You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's really interesting. Isn't that curious? And I caught myself doing that when I had some thoughts that I didn't like, and I just went, "Oh, isn't that curious?" That I. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In, in asking that question, this kind of goes to Donovan's point too, like in asking that question, it stopped a stickiness, you know, like being stuck right. or being drawn down or spiraling down. And so my question with that is sort of like asking that question is, is sort of shifting, stopping and shifting a way that you see mojo working. So when you ask that question, I like that you use the word shift because it really, when you ask that question, it, your body feels like it's moving into a different gear mm -hmm. because the brain, like I, I'm not big on balance. So uh, it's really, it, it, balance doesn't work for me because there's, sometimes I've involved with things that don't have, they don't have equal billing. So it's really hard to find a balance between things that don't have equal billing. But I am into equilibrium. And curio that question takes us, I'm, I probably explained this to you, Mary, where I've said, it's like we have one foot in, in each of two canoes and we're trying to just sort of basically not fall in the, in the water. But you wanna find a stable, and then you know how when you find it, your core feels so good so isn't that curious? I think that that shifts your core and it helps, it helps fine tune mojo in one area of your body, if, even in just in one area of your body. Does that feel, does, does that make sense to you? Yeah, I mean, I know that that technique works, but I'm trying to connect it with the mojo, like your idea of what mojo is, because it wasn't so much as a boost but it stopped me from going it does because it shifts it, it shifts it shifts your energy shifts your frequency yeah, yeah. which to me would yeah. be a mojo thing right because from as far from as, that, as mojo, and it was just yeah. a little shift maybe but from that little shift i had a different perspective or i could laugh which must yeah definitely raise your and, your frequency right Right, exactly. You can't be afraid and laughing at the same time. It's physiologically impossible. But I think you've just you've just said something brilliant there about how it shifted it just a little bit. And then you used the word sticky earlier. When you mm -hmm. shift just a little bit, it's like Velcro. You can hang on to that. It's not such a reach that you you know that you're going to slip so it, yeah it shifts it just a little bit so it becomes sticky in a good way i i, I curiosity is is um is very helpful most of the time and we know <laughs> we know when it isn't we know when our curiosity is not helpful and then we need to do what barry Ian says and it's like Okay, mind, I don't want to hear from you right now. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, just go. I'll let you know when I need your input. I think it, yeah, and habitually, you know, I was in in the habit of you know thinking first, feeling second, and I've okay. I, I've debated this with a number of people over over long periods of time, and I'm I'm of the absolute conclusion that feeling when feeling precedes thinking, we live better lives. Um, you know, we've, we've um, most of us, I think, have overthought things at the time. Um, and it's, I, I want to find my, my, uh, I want to find my heart flow first and my mind shift second. And it's really, really slight, helpful that that that. I, I have a, sorry, I have a slight. Uh, when you said feeling, life is better when we feel first. Is that is that what you said? Did yeah. I understand that? Yeah, I think. Okay, and even and if that even if would feelings think, are pain. Even if I would think there's some truth to that. Some of the people that I work with have, uh, they have extreme anxiety. So I think I would have to, um, I, would, I would want to add to that feeling first makes life better when feeling first calms your heart. If feeling first has rattled your heart then you're you're disreg you're dysregulating and actually it's really hard then to bring yourself back to center so i like what you said about earlier about leading with your heart and our heart has its own mind our gut has its own mind so that makes yeah. sense leading with your heart so that's uh when we feel first in such a way that our heart is wise and calm and full, as opposed to troubled, then that's probably a beautiful, beautiful launch pad for whatever step we're about to take took me a while and I know others as well to realize that what I thought was my feeling was actually my thinking. I, okay. Okay. And the, right. the feel of the heart, the trueness of the heart can be confused with the, you know, what's in our head because what's in our mind, we, we put there whether consciously or not. How, how do you describe the difference? Can you share the, can you, could you share a little bit about that with us about the difference of how do you know you're feeling with your heart versus your mind feeling? Well, what's the difference? It's very difficult to describe one way that, that is that um, when it's in your heart, you don't need to second guess. Whereas often in the mind, oh. that's one way that I differentiate, you know, because when I absolutely feel the truth for me, I don't second guess it. Whereas, okay. whereas if it's just a thought, you know, it's running around there, but I, I've learned to recognize that everything that's in my mind, I put there. And, you know, in the last mm -hmm. sort of, you know, whatever time of working, from a conscious perspective you know i'm now very careful about what i put in my mind but i'm 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 recognizing that there's a lot of things that i put in my mind before i was conscious of those things and they're they're all still there and they can come back you know it's just as you, everyone knows in a blink you know um you know i was just yesterday you know i was something wasn't going quite right out in the backyard and you know, I heard my grandfather speak as clear as clear as day. Um, it was a thought from back when I was a fourteen-year-old boy. It's it's all still there. Well, the heart doesn't mm -hmm. operate like that. Um, 
And, and the only way I can I can really describe it is you've got to play with it until you start to recognize your own essence. I call it essence. You're calling it mojo. Call it whatever whatever you 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 name suits you. But it's that part of us, that energy. That that is you know after all we we are all unique, one of a kind human beings. The great paradox of it all is we're part of one thing but we're a unique piece of that one thing. And it takes, a, I think it takes a lot of work to get our hearts and our minds around, around that. I, I differentiate often by using the words, am I doing this in service to others or am I doing this in service to myself? Because if it's yeah. in service to myself, that's the bullshit part of my ego, 95.9 you know, 99.9% .9 of the time. But if it's truly service to others, then there's a different feel to that. Yes, um, yes. I, I'm interested, one, one of the things we, when we talked, John, we talked about how music and nature are um, things that help us with this. Maybe you could right. expand, you know, explore some of that. You know, and that that is that is something that I'm I'm exploring more at this moment. So I, I didn't get enough information on that. First of all, I live with a composer, or in a previous slice of his life, he was a composer. So we have all these great conversations about vibrations, sound, frequencies wave action we live on a on a river lake situation so all of these functional physics that are part of our everyday life um, also become part of this uh, conversation we've had for decades about music now the funny part is that <laughs> lee doesn't really like music that much he likes the the physics of it but he's He'd rather listen to the birds. He'd rather listen to nature. So I was fascinated when I was doing some, when, when I'm doing some research on frequencies that, and forgive me, I don't have the right, the right uh, lingo here, but there is a modern day music scales, and there's many different music scales out there, but the modern day scale that we're used to, for I think most of us here, it comes in about 432 hertz. Nature has a certain frequency where if it is um, isolated, it's actually eight hertz, but that's not the same type of, that's not the same measurement, that's not the same scale as emotional frequencies. The fascinating thing is that the music of 432 marries or resonates with nature it's a slightly different, um, it's in a different plane, but it's parallel. And that is why nature and music in the 432 hertz scale, that's why those two frequencies together will help heal. Because those specific frequencies, they're sort of like, uh, what am I trying to think of? It's like a master frequency. They will play well every other frequency that a human is feeling. The sea is the same thing. I, I'm fortunate, uh, my wife and I and the dog, we walk daily, rain, hail, I shine. But um, yesterday was a great example of, of this because there was pretty much no wind. And when we walk, we have the ocean on the left and the, and the bush on the right. So we're in the, right. I call it, you know, I say to people, um, uh, this is paradise. Um, and yesterday, yeah. yesterday, the sea, it was so calm, it was like glass. And there was barely, barely a, a breeze. And we we're walking along. And I said to my wife, this is as good as it gets. Because and there wasn't a cloud in the sky. Because there was a frequency, you know, an energy force that was all at, at one and we found ourselves walking at a pace that was just in in line with the sea and the bush it was a magical time i 
I like to think that these are the frequencies that get between each of our molecules and becomes this, this sort of um, almost like a lubricant where everything then works better. Everything works in tandem. Equilibrium is found. And it's easy, I was thinking of you, Mary, it's easy to be curious in the best way possible. There's no the zone. Yeah. This is the zone. Yeah. And the and the physics yeah. the physics is it's the same frequency. Mm -hmm. The reson yeah. it's a reson a resonant. And that's the thing. Yeah. That's the thing with what we're talking about. Mojo, heart. There's there's a reson there's a resonance. And when well, you, and when you learn your own resonance, that's the magic. And the law of resonance, like there's, you know, we've got however many universal laws, but the law of resonance is foundational. It, it's so interesting because it's invisible. It, more than any other universal law, I feel that the law of resonance is, it's invisible, and yet it is like, um, it's like an echo. We have... We have um, on this property, we have um, the land is ridgebacks going down from the upper plains where all the farmyard is, and you go in ridgebacks down to the water. So there's lots of gullies where we live. There's, there's a spring to the east, there's a spring to the west, there's a lowland to the east, there's a lowland to the west where there's little, the springs are running through, but there's also these hollows of the boreal forest. And we have about this time of year, the thrush come back. And they nest in a certain part of the forest on the west side of our house so that when they sing, it's the most stunning sound because it's as if the rest of the surrounding area becomes this container and the thrush sings into it. It has such a fullness where you can, you feel the echo, but the, there is no echo because the echo is married to the moment the thrush is singing, but it's so full that you realize that there's nothing but resonance and rebound from all the trees and all the leaves. And it is, it's just, oh, it's, it's magical. It, everything falls away when you hear that sound. I think if we had a quest it would be to live in resonance. Mm. As I understand it, that's why the birds go back to where they were born, because there's a resonance there. Um, and and we even we humans, um, I feel the same thing, David, when I go back to Ballarat, Ballarat, even though I don't live there anymore, Ballarat will always be home. There's an energy there that I felt as a child that I still feel when I go back there. And it's funny you say that. <clears throat> I feel exactly the same way when I come down and visit Ocean Grove, Ian. Um, that's where I'm <laughs> originally from. And um, I go down there and I must admit, it's, um, it just uh, puts you at peace and just calms you when you feel like you're at home. Just walking along the, that Ocean Grove beach, um, there's nothing quite like it for me. I feel that every time I come to Ballarat and I open the car door and step out, even when it's blowing a gale or as chilly as all hell, which it can, it can be, I feel a, a resonance. But, but I think we, you know, we're feeling a resonance in, in together here today. There's a, there's a resonance. We're all, we're all putting our different label on it, but we're here together and yet there's a part of it that's that's our own experience there's a resonance to it um, nancy duarte uh, she wrote a great book called resonance which i i read yes good book um good book. Uh, and i think there's just, there's just something about this you know we live in a uh, we live in a time where i feel like there's a, there's, this is the great energy shift. 
it's going on in so many ways because the old the old world um, doesn't work as well as it once did, and in some cases, you know, it did it shouldn't have worked the way it did. But I feel we're yeah. we're in the great shift. I'm I'm so glad to be alive in the world today, despite all of our problems and challenges, because I think we're undergoing a shift. To use your word, Mary, it's a, it is a wonderful word, shift. Um, I think we're undergoing a shift that will be life-changing for the planet and for you know the majority of people living on it. I think there's a, f a few folk trying to hang on to the old world, and they'll they'll do so for as long as it as they possibly can because it's you know it's where they got their you know their wealth from, you know, and so they're hanging on. Um, but there's a shift going on and they won't be able to resist. Um, and hopefully they'll, they'll join in this new, this new world. Uh, I think this new world has been waiting to birth itself for quite some time. Um, some writers um, go, are calling it the new Renaissance and it began you know, back in the 80s, according to some writers. If you look at Chris Katerna or you know, folk like that. Um, and I, I kind of sense sense that, and I think we every first Wednesday we have these conversations, and we we keep, we come to this place, and we have this same sense every time that we're in a, we're in a special time, and we're all part of making this energy happen. So Brad, Brad, and Donovan, David, Brian, maybe a bit more for you, Anna. Incredible that it's after one a.m. and you're still. Um, your energy is still with us. I'm loving this. This is fabulous. That, I don't want to see myself tomorrow morning, but for now, I'm great. <laughs> um, I think it's a moment. Oh, oh, you go, Brian. Oh, go with that. It's, um, if we look at it, Dawn's got a... a a connection with with sounds and frequencies to me i've got a connection with with temperature she dawn talks about a frequency of, of um you know different emotions of different frequencies i i feel that you know cold feet warm heart all those sayings that are that potentially old-fashioned have got a, a lot of sense of truth in them it, it's sitting there going if i'm feeling excited or, or joy or, or whatever it's, it's coming from the, the the warmth in my in my heart if I'm feeling anger or fear um, I might be sort of hot in the head or you know cold feet and all those sorts of sayings that we get to me resonates more closely with with my connections but sitting there going that that just also proves that not everything not everyone's going to connect with everything but to me, temperature is is connected to emotions rather than, than a frequency. I'm, I'm not a, a sound person, if that makes sense. Uh, that makes sense. And uh, that makes sense to me for me, um, because I think I think frequencies absolutely have different temperatures. Sound is just like one way that people interpret them. but as when you were speaking, Brian, you know, you're right. When, when we feel certain ways, our body, I think our body does have different temperatures for sure. So frequencies absolutely make sense that it would be tied to temperatures and to sh changes in temperature, shifts and switches in temperature. And colors probably, yeah. Fully agree. You, you look at, you know, red and blue and you're sitting there instantly hot and cold and you could almost draw different emotions in a colour. And if I drew a body that was red and a body that was blue or a body with blue feet and red heart and etc. You wouldn't need to actually explain emotion to, um, you know, people that are tuned in. They, they'd pick up what emotion was what by probably I'm guessing drawing, uh, just drawing with two different colors where, where people are feeling the emotion in the body would, would be able to guess accurately what that emotion was. 
one of the things that helps me to learn is you may be able to see these, but these are the these are like, this is these are the notes that I'm making. It's the different the different colours so when I go back <laughs> and look at them. But you know, identify Brian. If I've got cold feet, I'm dysfunctional. I'm totally dysfunctional oh. if I've got cold feet. Oh. So I, I've got to, if I ever ever do get cold feet, which is not very often, I've got to immediately warn them up. I just can't operate if my feet if my feet are cold. And oh. similarly, if when I so I identify the temperature, I also identify with the sound. If I, if I need to um, get back to my best place, I just put on rock and roll music, and I'm there quite quickly. Because I was raised with rock and roll, I played in rock and roll bands. Um, so that's a you know is, there's a resonance there and i think we've all got our our own way temperature sound color you know whatever whatever's our way david you were going to comment um i was just reflecting on the whole conversation um it's interesting um i suppose what you're saying dawn is you can allow yourself to feel um I don't know, upset and in shame and in and different things like that, provided you're able to acknowledge it and then um, accept it and then find a path back to working out what some degree of joy would be like um, again, um, which I'm sure um, many would be having over the past period. Obviously, we're um, down here in Victoria looking at the uh, possibility of further days in lockdown, which is un unfortunate, especially when we're in regional locations without cases. Um, but I suppose rather than seeing that as a problem, um, what I'm seeking to try and do as best I can is to see it as a real opportunity to um, stop and reflect and pause again like we did last year and remember all the positives that came from um, COVID lockdowns and um, try and use those things again to use this as a mini break and just to not worry about the feeling of worry, acknowledge the fact, yep, I, I, I feel it and I noticed you like you said before, but at the same time, hang on a minute, what did I do last time in this same situation? So then um, I'm best placed to help others because there's heaps of people I need to help. So I can't help them if I'm um, dwelling and feeling down and sorrowful all the time. Yeah. You know, you mentioned a couple of things. You, you said acknowledge what I'm feeling and then find some degree of joy. I think that that's really important. It's not the whole pizza full of joy, just a little slice of it or a little morsel of it. Or, okay, there's a piece of, in Canada, we have pineapple on our pizza. So, oh, there's a little piece of pineapple left. But, and I, I think finding our way through it, however we can, it's really important. You mentioned the idea of reframing. Okay, well, what, can I, can I turn this situation into something that looks a little better, feels a little better? How would I do that? So, oh, I'll reframe it as an opportunity. Okay, great. And the other thing you asked, which is a really powerful question for us to ask of ourselves is what worked last time? Mm -hmm. But did anything help last time? And also the flip side of that is what didn't work last time? Maybe what didn't work last time? Could I remember that? Or do I really want more of that feeling? Honestly, sometimes, sometimes we want to feel crappy. And we will do things. We will play music. I don't know about you guys, but I know women play music. We know it's going to make us cry. Ugly cries, really ugly, ugly tears. And we put the stuff on. And it's because if we can, I was talking about dysregulation before, when we cry, we are regulating our emotions. When we push ourselves to, to the edge of feeling crappy, sometimes I think that's the way that we regulate our emotions because we can actually recognize then this feels lousy. And then you go back to how can I turn this into some degree of joy? How can I find I would, my way back to some degree of joy? I was, I was starting to feel better, Dawn, until you mentioned pizza. Um, I was just talking <laughs> to Ian, 
Ian there before about Ocean Grove, and I do love Ocean Grove pizza. I'm not going to be able to have that for a little while. I'm going to have to feel that pain mm. and accept it um, and have something <laughs> different for lunch. <laughs> oh. All right, oh. all right, folks. Well, our, our time has flown, uh, so we're coming in for a, uh, a landing. Uh, so we've got a, a ten minutes or so left. So, any any other uh, thoughts, takeaways? Um, Brad, I know you've had to attend to some um, work matters while you've been with us, but um, and you're in a period of transition yourself. So maybe there's some good takeaways today, Brad. We haven't, we haven't got your sound yet, Brad. Can you hear me now? There you go. There you go. I had to hit the, the mute button on the earbud, which I forgot about. I was just saying there's always takeaways from this group. So I just wanted to thank Dawn for, for taking the time because um, it does resonate quite well, actually, when you, you, you talk about how you um, regulate your rhythm. And I think that's the most important takeaway for me. And and putting it in context about the different levels that you can operate on. I think that's the strongest takeaway. Wonderful. We each have our own rhythm um, and learning how it feels and what it's like and what gets us there. Um, I know myself, I spent a, a large part of my life being fast and furious. And then, and then I found out my rhythm was actually slow and considered. And so I spent half my life going too fast for my own good. Um, but of course, the learning um, has had profound um, impact on the latter half of my life. Well, uh, some other some other takeaways. Some I think this has been a um, it's been a, another launching pad for me, Dawn. I've got I've got more ideas floating around than what I can deal with at the moment. I'm, I think I've made 10 pages of notes. Well, I'm, I'm glad that, that there were things that landed softly. For me, that's a part of resonance and a part of mojo as well. Mojo, uh, for me, it's not these bombastic spikes of energy surges. It's things that happen and they land softly. And I think that's part of the heart approach, the heartful approach. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, um, mojo, which is really the art of resonance, I think. I, I've, I, I've followed the art of resonance for a long time. It's my, one of my favorite universal laws, but it's, it's all about leaving room for good to happen. We don't know when good is gonna happen. You can't always orchestrate bad, but if you take care of the good, if you, if you take care of what you can and remember to leave room for good to happen, there's a pretty positive chance that it will it will find you. We um, part of our career uh, has been in the farming industry, and we decided I don't know 25 years ago that we were going to farm organic field, you know, thousands of acres driving across fields. Well, <laughs> the secret to farming organically is to think like a weed. That's it, because you can't use any chemi chemicals to kill weeds. So you must think like a weed and you must observe. And maybe this is where the whole idea of I see you started. I remember once we planted this organic crop, mustard, yellow mustard, wimpiest crop out there. Picky, picky little crop, but worth a lot of money. No kidding, because it's so picky. So we planted this mustard, this mustard came up. Oh, we were so happy. And then all the weeds came up. Oh, it's full of weeds. That's awful. It's really hard to clean these weeds out of the mustard seed. And then the army worms arrived and we're thinking, okay, we're doomed. We're doomed. This 80 acre crop, it's going to you know, push us in the, in the red. And then we realized that the army worms prefer the weed seeds to mustard seeds. So oh, this is good. They will eat the weed seeds first. 
these army worms went in there and they stripped all these weed seeds in a matter of day, days. So I, it was my job to go and check on that. And I said, okay, all the weeds are gone. The, the mustard is looking fabulous. It's out of, out of bloom, it's going into seed. Now we're really doomed because the army worms have not left yet. So we just had to accept it. There's nothing you can do. So just let nature take its course. Ah, and this is where the law of resonance comes in big time. The next day, this, this field was about a mile away from me, from where I live, where our house is. The next day I saw this huge flock of birds circling in the sky. And I heard this cacophony of noise. I thought, what is that? And then I realized they were ravens. And I thought, why are there so many ravens together? Oh, there's lots of ravens. Not that many. And I drove up to the field and the ravens had descended on the field and they picked that field clean of every army worm that had chosen to move in there with the cleanest crop of mustard that you could ever hope for. And we did nothing but stand back. <laughs> so when we leave room for good, sometimes we have the very, very best experience with resonance. Wonderful. Other thoughts before we sort of come in for a landing? One observation, I, I think, and that was a wonderful story. Thank you, Dawn. Um, is that with these conversations or spark and actions, Ian, is that you actually don't, it, it takes a little while to mull over in the, in, in the mind and you get sort of thoughts or, or reflections or um, things connect when you when you give it space to connect and it's, and it's not always instantly around this conversation it's next week you might have an aha moment or two o'clock in the morning you might have an aha moment and thank you very much and i'll put that aha moment back in the cot and put its blanket in and say i'll, I'll, I'll i won't forget you i'll talk to you in the morning um but yeah there's a whole lot of um gold in here that we just need to sort of let mix around in the pot for a while before we wash it off and i think that's one of the great things about these conversations and that i made a note in the in the in the comment section there the trick of silence is something that i am learning more and more to use and i liken it to the the, the story just the dawn just shared with sitting there going the inaction created the outcome the outcome that you wanted you was achieved by doing nothing, by observing and being aware of what was going on, but not intervening. Um, and sometimes I personally find that I jump to solution too quickly rather than let things be. All right, so anybody else before I close the recording? Um, Dawn. Sorry, hey, sorry to say thank you, Dawn, for sharing everything today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, that was really great. Oh, and I've got welcome. a lot of notes. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, I've taken heaps of notes. So thank and I've got a book recommendation to resonance. I'm gonna add that to my wish list on my or an audible. Same here. Yeah. Thank you, Dawn. It was lovely. Anna, it's you're such a trooper to stay with us. And Mary, I know it's not all that early where you are either. So Good on you for staying with us too, Mary. Thanks for that. It's great to meet everyone here. Wherever, whatever season you're in, it was really good to connect. Thanks, Dawn. Wonderful. Thanks, Ian. Wonderful. Um, the art of resonance. I think that's a a wonderful place to um, to leave our conversation. And my great takeaway: um, leaving room for good. I wish you I wish you all well in that endeavor. And we'll look forward to seeing you uh, next time. Next month, we have our guest is Erica Bagshaw, and she's going to talk about heart-connected leadership. 
She's one of the heart math uh, folk in Australia and um, that, oh. will be, that will be another um, great conversation. But thank you all, Thank, but particularly Dawn, thank you so much for- This is uh, wonderful, thanks. A thank you. Conversation. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.